Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so the barrier between ourselves and lunch is now me. Okay, so as you can see, the topic of my talk is about establishing a mobile security mindset. So I'm going to be talking about the issue of mobile device security and our use of those devices. And in particular, something around the way that we as individuals and also organizations think about the devices, treat the devices, and perhaps some disconnects between what we do and what we should be doing. So setting the scene, what I'm particularly interested in this context is these sort of the de de devices, these so-called post-PC era devices of our smartphones and our tablets. And the reason that these are, I think, particularly interesting is the range of capabilities that they've now opened up for us. And they're, I say, in terms of our personal use and in terms of our business use. I think they are revolutionizing the way that we're going about things. And one of the reasons for that is the sheer capability, the, the style of things you can now do with these. So you've got significant volumes of storage on these. If you compare these to the what are now termed feature phones of the past, our, our typical cell phones that, well, perhaps could store text messages and a few contacts and things of that nature, we're now dealing with significantly more than that. I mean, a typical device, I guess, is quite happily in the 32 gigabyte range of built-in storage, and in many cases, more than that. We've got high volumes of connectivity. These are things that can connect onto the, the internet and also quite readily onto local area networks and personal area network connectivity with Bluetooth and things. So that's very convenient from one perspective, but it's also something that opens up additional threat vectors, we could say. And as a consequence of their power and capability, we can also do far more with them in terms of the applications that they run, and more particularly the data that they're then holding and what we do with it. Okay, so I say that's, that's the scene setting. Anybody remember that, do that device? That's an iPad 1. Does any anybody remember the iPad 1 now? Anybody still using one of those? Seems oh so long ago, doesn't it? That uh, you know, this, this sort of device seems quite dated by comparison to what we've got now, but it was only about five years ago. And already tablet type devices seem to be a fairly standard part of what we're dealing with. Just for, for my interest and perhaps yours, how many people have got a tablet device now? Okay, so for the purposes of the video recording, that's the majority of the room. And a smartphone? Okay, and even more hands went up for that. So, you, you, you know the sort of technology that I'm talking about. So, thinking about what we've got on them then, we've now got the data in a far more vulnerable location than, for example, putting it on a standard desktop PC or even a laptop, because these devices are far more portable and they're far more losable in that context. So, they're the sort of things that we can have in our pocket one minute and then we've sat down, it's slipped out, and we might not have noticed. And they're the sort of things that you might accidentally leave behind. We'll have some stats on that later. But perhaps they're likely to receive less protection than data that we're storing on our more traditional devices that we already know the risks of and that have been drummed into us over the years. And, and often, the options available to us in terms of protecting things on these sort of devices are less than the we would get on a standard desktop or laptop. You've got fewer options, fewer controls. Sometimes you don't even have the software that you can actually install to provide the protection. We'll come to that later. And so attitudes towards protection, how we think about them, is sometimes different, again, to our traditional computing scenarios. Now, just to evidence that you are not alone in terms of your technology usage, um, we've got some stats here from various surveys. So, 88% of the uh, young adult population in the UK now owns a smartphone, and 44% of households, recognising that it's typically household usage of these sort of tablet devices, not necessarily everyone has them individually, but certainly households have one that they, they share around, and that in itself can sometimes present an additional dimension to the risk that we're, we're facing. So 44%, almost half have one, and that's from Ofcom stats from last year. So doubtless these numbers have only gone up since then. <laughs> 
If we look at Biz's Information Security Breaches Survey from last year, so a new edition of that survey actually will come out later this year, but even then, 95% of large organizations allow their staff to connect to basically the organization systems through this type of device. Okay, so there's a lot of this going on in the workplace scenario. Looking at Ernst & Young's Global Information Security Survey from 2013, there's some recognition of the risks that this brings. So, thinking about mobile computing generally, almost half believe that that has increased their exposure to attacks during the preceding year um, in which they were reflecting on when completing the survey. So there's a lot of it about, and it's not doing anything to reduce the security concerns, is the, the key messages here. But I say one of the potential challenges in this context is, okay, we've now got devices that are taking our data even more further afield, more mobile, but our security mentality perhaps hasn't kept up with this. So we're dealing with a lot of the same data. We, we've got even more of the same sort of services now available in the palm of our hand on these devices that we'd have previously had to sit down and use at a, at a keyboard. But our security practices, well, have they really kept up? So. In many cases, you can see, and you might well recognize from personal experience or what you've seen in your organization, because doubtless you're all doing this properly, but you've seen other people doing things where, okay, the technology has been deployed and it's been given out to people, but it hasn't necessarily been accompanied by the appropriate guidance on how to use something and protect it securely. And some of the things that we've learned about on the desktop in terms of protecting our data, making sure that it's, it's not sent to people that it shouldn't be sent to and not shared, etc., is perhaps not translating and not transferring into these sort of devices. And so we're, we're readily doing things here in a, in a more open, more sharing manner than we would necessarily have done when using what we recognize as a traditional PC. Okay, so this applies to both organizational use and individual perceptions on the issue. So if we think about the sort of things we're carrying around, why is, why is this of any sort of concern? So just think about this as a typical sort of smartphone type device, and then you've got all of these standard apps on the device, the things that typically come pre-installed, all of which have some data that is certainly personal, could in many cases be business relevant, and in many cases could be sensitive. So you've got things like our schedule, what we're doing, when we're doing it, who we're doing it with, social networks, task lists, sort of what, what tasks we've got on our to-dos, various forms of messaging. So we've got some text message type things, we've got emails, we've got notes that we might have stored, which again could have both personal and business relevance. Images, certainly you can encounter sensitive imagery being on people's devices. They, you know, often you ask people if you've got anything sensitive on your device. And, yeah, no, not really, don't need, need to protect this. And then you say, okay, hand your device to somebody else and let them freely browse through it. And then the thought process starts to kick in. And, oh, I've got a photo of that on there and I've got this messaging and perhaps, no, I'll take my device back. And you're not gonna look at it after all. Um, we've got our contacts. So again, some of those could be sensitive. We don't necessarily want to share with it. Well, sometimes we do. I mean, if you look at the way people behave on social networks, some people, it seems they want to share everything about themselves at every moment, but sometimes they don't realize the implications. And you've got, again, browsers. What, what have you been looking at on the web? Which, again, for some people, when you ask them, what have you been looking at on the web, they look instinctively and immediately guilty. And you've got to wonder, what have they been doing? But anyway, all of this stuff is on a device that you're now carrying around. And again, it might be relevant from the, your organization's perspective or just personally, but it has some value. Okay, and it has, in many cases, some sensitivity. So that's one of the fundamental reasons it, it requires a bit of protection. So, okay, what are the problems? So we've got the potential for data loss. So we could actually lose the device. I say it's, it's more vulnerable to that because it's smaller, more portable, and it's it around with us rather than being left in a secure location. The device could be stolen. Okay, so 
I mean, basically, uh, there are many instances of reports of people using their phone in public or holding a device, and somebody just snatches it and runs away. And you know, if you're anything like me, you can't then keep up with the person who snatched it. Um, or you could damage the device, and that again has the potential if you've not backed it up. We heard reference to backup earlier. If you've not backed it up, that again ultimately leads to your data being lost. So there's all those dimensions. Um, it can facilitate unauthorized access to other things that you're already connected to. So you've got your email, often your organizational email, immediately there on the device. Sometimes once you've switched the device on, sometimes after you've authenticated on the device. Um, you've got various intranet services that you might be accessing, and of course other things like your social network apps. Typically these things don't require any additional authentication once you're already using the device. So it often hinges on have you got anything at point of entry, which we'll come to in a second. Some of them allow you to put removable media into them and often that media itself is unencrypted so if you've got a device that's got an SD card for example somebody coming along just popping that card out and walking off with it has often got unencrypted access to whatever you had you've got on at least one of the platforms a significant risk of exposure to malware and generally from the organization's perspective a potential lack of control over what people are doing with the devices and we'll come on to that as well so if we look at, okay, what's reported? What are people already doing to set the, the landscape for this and have some degree of protection? This again, from the Information Security Breaches Survey of last year. So I've headed this one general posture. This is all sets of results from what they asked about people's use of smartphone and tablet devices, if I remember correctly. So, okay, a small proportion of organizations, you notice they partition the results into small and large respondents. A small proportion don't allow such devices to connect at all. So we see that the, in the majority of cases, these devices are known to be in use. Some of them, quite a significant proportion in the case of large organizations, only allow corporately provided devices to be connected. So the, the bring your own device context is, is prohibited there. Um, and we'll come on to the implications of that as well later on. Some of them have just done nothing about it, more particularly in the smaller organizations. In the large organizations, there is at least some recognition that something needs to be done. But then let's have a look at the different types of things they, they might have done other than banning outright. So do they have policy measures in place? So, okay, a defined security strategy that relates to these categories of mobile device. Well, again, okay, the large organizations, two thirds of them have done so, slightly less uh, prominent in the case of small organizations. But there's already a fair disconnect now between those large organizations that have defined a strategy in relation to this and those that know such devices are being used. Have they issued a policy? Okay, so even more important, direct guidance or direct um, clarity on what is permitted and what's not. 75% of large organizations say, okay, the majority are doing something, but a quarter aren't. And small organizations, again, resources um, available to do so, perhaps less so and correspondingly less evidence of policies in place. Have they trained staff, made them aware even about the threats that exist in this context? And again, tangibly lower results there than the proportion that know the devices are in use and in many cases are actively countenancing that, that activity to occur. So okay, maybe it relies on technical measures having been taken. So often we find that uh, the technology controls are easier to justify and, and implement than getting policies and more nebulous things like that sorted out. So have they protected the corporate email and calendars on these devices? And again, certainly not all of them, even in the large organizations. Um, implemented encryption? No, not, not in the majority of cases. And implemented MDM, mobile device management, which again we'll come on to. Okay, large organizations much more prominent in doing so, so they've got a greater degree of control over the devices themselves and what they're doing, but this is more likely to apply to those devices they've issued than the BYOD scenarios. So again, that just sets the scene on, okay, there's a recognized issue of use of the devices, but perhaps not an established culture of dealing with them in terms of policy or technology.
So what sort of things might we want to consider here? So things we, examples of things we might want to protect against is unauthorized use, so somebody being able to pick up the device and, and get access to it fundamentally. We want to consider what happens in the event of loss or theft. We might not be able to prevent that in itself, but there usefully could be a response we could take to protect the device and our data if that happens. We need to think about data leakage. What is the device holding and sharing around with others? And again, in some cases, the issue of malicious code, which is a growing problem, and I say particularly on the Android platform, and I'll evidence that later. So a variety of things that we might want to consider in terms of how to do this, and none of these are necessarily technologies and approaches that we've not encountered before. Perhaps the, the concept of remote lock and wipe is not something we're as used to in, let's say, the context of a desktop machine. But all of the rest, these are things that we've hopefully been in some way used to using and seeing in our security lives in the traditional environment. So let's give some more thought to, to several of these categories. So the first one then, in terms of preventing the unauthorized use and unauthorized access on the device, you can go with some sort of user authentication. And here's your chance to shine, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you have got some form of user authentication on your mobile device? OK, that certainly is the majority. It certainly wasn't all. OK, so we have an increasing range of options available to us on the devices these days. So we've got the traditional stuff, the passwords and the pins. So even back to the days of the, the feature phone, the standard cell phone, you've got the option to have a, a, at least a four digit pin on the device. On the smartphone devices and on the tablets, you can in many cases have a longer than four digit pin. So not even going to the password technology, you can have a, still a pin, a, a numeric sequence, but as you can see here, going to, to longer than four digits, so it's not a predictable length. Um, you can use traditional passwords, but they're perhaps more fiddly to enter when you're dealing with a small device, certainly the handheld sort of smartphone device. If you're having to type a multi-character type 14, 15, 16, whatever length of password you, you think is appropriate on that sort of virtual keyboard. If you've got fingers like mine, they're not normally that sort of dexterous and it gets difficult and this sort of, sort of thing that you can tap more readily is easier. On certain devices, um, Android ones, for example, have the pattern unlock. So you're now leveraging the, the use of the touch screen to give you a different type of secret. So if you've not encountered this, the idea is that you've got a, a secret pattern where you join the dots in the right order. How many people use pattern unlock? Okay, so a few people. Yeah, it's quite user-friendly, quite nicely suited to a touch screen. It does have some disadvantages in terms of observability. If, you, if you've ever, sort of somebody else who doesn't use it, watch somebody who does, and particularly if they're in some way in front of you, and particularly if it's highlighting the pattern as they do it, it's quite visible. You also can end up with smear marks on the screen, which if you look at it in the light, you can see the pattern that's been used. Um, that's not the only gesture touch-based one that's around. Uh, so Windows 8, for example, uses picture password where you can associate some gestures with a secret image or the image is actually seen on the screen, but then you've got secret points within the image, up to three of them that you can associate lines, circles or dots with, and you have to do those in the right position and the right order. And again, the disadvantage is potentially the observability and the smear marks left on the screen. Um, you've got on some devices, uh, a lot of them now have front-facing cameras, of course, so you can use face recognition. So you hold the device up, it recognizes that you're the authorized user, and it lets you in. Varying degrees of uh, robustness of such methods. So um, this, is, this is showing it on uh, an Android device. Um, and the early implementation of this was such that you could actually just show it a static photograph of the legitimate user and it would quite happily let you in. Now it does um, so-called liveness detection, so it requires you to blink um, when you, you look at the camera. So you hold it up and you blink to prove that you're a living person, not a photograph. But there are potential ways around that as well, such as cutting eye holes within a picture and blinking behind that. Okay, so that, that can still potentially fool it. And then you've got things like fingerprint 
recognition. So on the iPhone 5S that started out and now you've got uh, various other Apple iPhone and iPad devices that have got the so-called Touch ID and similarly on the Samsung devices, you on Samsung S5 and also iPhone 5S, Samsung S5, lots of S's and 5's, you've got fingerprint recognition there as well. They work in different ways, there's different levels of potential vulnerability there but you know they're the sort of thing that doesn't get as easily compromised by simple observation as things like those do. Things like the face recognition, okay, even if you're not trying to fool it with a photograph, as a legitimate user, you can still get complications in situations like darkness, because it can't see you. And in things like fingerprint recognition, you've still got scenarios where Okay, fingerprints all very well, but if you've got gloves on, or if it's raining, or something like this, or if your fingers are particularly dirty, it doesn't work very effectively then. So you get the problems of false rejection of the user. Looking at some survey results that we've done here at the university, actually involving, well, over 1,200 respondents um, from a variety of sample populations in this set of results, and I've combined them together because pretty much they all told a similar story. Um, so we looked at the degree to which people were using different types of authentication on their devices. You can see that the, tra the traditional methods still dominate. This doesn't total 100% because people might have multiple methods enabled on the devices. So, for example, you still have to have some sort of pin or password underlying your face or fingerprint approach, for instance. Relatively few people these days say they don't use anything, which is, which is quite encouraging, but 5% is still a window of opportunity there. And, okay, we didn't go into the granularity of what length of PIN and whether they were using predictable sequences. But the key thing is majority of people are using something. But whether that something is commensurate with the value of the data they're holding on the device is, is potentially another matter. Okay, now I mentioned about the risks of the, the mobility itself, the risks of the device being out and about with you, and drawing on some data from Kaspersky from almost a couple of years ago, August 2013, you can see that from, they had a, a significantly larger sample population than we did, but one in six of the users that they surveyed had experienced some sort of issue with their mobile, or one or more of their mobile devices. So we can see, okay, 4% had experienced them being stolen, 3% had had them lost, some of them had had them irreparably damaged. All of those contexts, if you've not got the data backed up, put, the, the, put your access to that data at risk, and certainly those contexts, the loss and the theft, put the data at further risk if you've not got some authentication and further protection on the device. So again, exercise time, how many people have had their device lost or stolen at some point in the room? One, two, okay, not that many, or not that many willing to admit it. Okay, that's fair enough. Or you're quite lucky, so that's good. Now, okay, loss and theft, those are obvious scenarios in which you, know, you want to have some sort of protection if you can. And one of the things that you can do increasingly on the devices these days is enable something that will protect the device when it's no longer in your possession. Now, you can do this as an organization through mobile device management solutions, but you can also do it as an individual now in many cases through features like, I'm using an iOS example, but Android and uh, BlackBerry have similar. Um, find my iPhone on iPhones and iPads, where if you've got this enabled, you can then locate where your device is, so you can actually see the position, I've not got a, a picture of that, but you can see where it is on a map, and you can also do things remotely to the device, such as make it make a sound, so if you think you've maybe lost it around the home or the office, you can make it beep so that you can sort of hear where it is and perhaps find it. Then if you can't locate it, if you can't hear it, then perhaps it's actually lost, and so you can then remotely lock the device or even wipe the device if you want to be absolutely sure that nobody's going to get access to what you had on it. So, say so these are useful safeguards um, once the device is no longer in your possession. Another thing to bear in mind is that even when you've still got the device, if you've not got it set up properly, let's say, or if you've been 
over permissive in terms of what you've agreed for the device to share, then it could be happily spewing out data left, right and centre, perhaps to your friends, your, your social network contacts, the pe what people can see about you anyway, but also between other apps and between things in the cloud. So just looking, for example, again, as an iOS example, looking at the iCloud settings and the things that the device will synchronise with iCloud, which, you know, in theory, you shouldn't be able to get or shouldn't be able to find other people then getting access to it, but you know, think about celebrities and their various photographs that got shared to iCloud uh, um, last autumn. Presumably they didn't expect those photographs to be more widely accessible, but nonetheless they were, and that's because their device had been synchronizing the photos they took with the iCloud service, and then something happened which enabled them to become more widely available, which they wouldn't have predicted. And there's all various things you can, you can synchronize with iCloud there. And again, I'm not saying it's bad, but be aware that the configuration settings are there and what you actually want to be leaving your device in that context. And also, there's various options for sharing in other contexts. So you've got the various privacy settings and what features of your device your various apps are allowed to use so for example many of the apps want access to your camera and your camera roll you know, and what what do they need that access for the devices want access to your location they want access to your contacts they want access to anything you'll grant them your level of control over that access is perhaps not as granular as you'd like. So, for example, you've got, I'm um, just using this one for instance, Shazam here. Um, okay, it can have access to the microphone. Okay, it needs it as part of what the application does to listen to the music you're playing. Let's think about the photo one, Twitter here. On or off for Twitter's access to your photographs. But what does that mean? Does that mean Twitter can add to your photos? or that it can read from your photos, actually means both. But you don't have independent control over that. And perhaps in some cases, you'd like to say, OK, I'm happy for it to add things, but not to see what I've already got. But again, the level of control you get once you've enabled something is, is perhaps not as good as we'd like. Perhaps the, well, the biggest growing threat, though, I mean, uh, some of these are manageable if, we're, if our use of the device is appropriate. We can think to enable the authentication to an appropriate level. We can think to enable the, the tracking of the device, etc., and set up the privacy. A growing problem is malware. And this is something, as, as this slide tries to indicate, that's been predicted for quite some time. It was always suggested that malware would come along on cell phones and then later smartphones, PDAs. Anybody remember the acronym PDA? Personal Digital Assistant, that sort of thing, before they became smartphones. So, you know, they've been around and you had things like the Liberty Trojan, the phage virus, the Kabir worm. The Kabir worm was an interesting early example of replication across the devices. It spread via Bluetooth and it specifically asked you on the screen for permission to infect your device. And you know, some people nonetheless let it do so. But it was fairly rudimentary at that stage. It was very much a proof of concept. And you, know, you could see that something was happening and you just allowed it to happen explicitly. But I say practical factors previously had held things back. So there wasn't that widespread a set of devices that could actually run executable code. And there wasn't a really big target population compared to all of those Windows users, let's say, that were already there on desktops and laptops. This has changed over time, and we now have you know, clearly leading players in the mobile device space in terms of operating system, Android, iOS, Windows to some degree, BlackBerry to some degree, but Android and iOS are significant portions of the market share, particularly Android these days. Okay, so you know, this was something long predicted, so here's a, a first page of an article I wrote back in 2005 saying the increasing incidence of malware on mobile devices is a significant cause for concern. The arrival of a viable and widespread population of targets is likely to mean it's going to become more troublesome, and sure enough, it did. Okay, so now these devices are genuinely in practice a significant target. Okay, it's still much smaller than you get on the traditional platforms, but it's a problem that's growing and has been growing significantly month on month, year on year, since around 2011, 2012, it's really taken off. And it can be another 
basically root for data leakage, theft from your device, and various other things that you don't want. So back doors being opened, and in many cases, the, the predominant problem that the malware has caused, I suppose, up to now on these platforms is around SMS fraud, costing you money through basically bogus SMSs being sent and reaping a, a financial reward for somebody else. Now, in terms of the market share, you can see from this graph, it's quite clear that one operating system has cornered the market here, and, and that's Android with, well, according to figures from October 2014, 98.96% market share of the, the mobile malware. So that's not to say it doesn't appear on other platforms, but of course, other platforms don't have to worry about it quite as much. So how many people here are Android users? And how many of you have got antivirus on your device? Okay, good. The majority of hands stayed up, so that was good. That was, as you will see on a forthcoming slide, that is not the norm, but there again, you're a security audience, so we, we, we'd expect it. So, Android, where the major problem is. Part of the reason for this, I guess, is that there's a difference in the way that the, the App Store approaches work on the different platforms. So Apple, with, the, with their App Store, as they actually call it, have always had a walled garden approach. They have basically not the ability for anybody to put content in there, and any content that's submitted to the App Store gets exposed to some level of code verification, some sort of checking to ensure that it's not malicious. By contrast, the Google Play Store, as it's now called, is pretty much open and free, and people can put content in there that doesn't get verified to ensure that it's non-malicious, and therefore it's given more of a playground for this sort of activity. Now, so you can see, again from Kaspersky data, looking over the years, from January 2011, in that particular month, there were just eight new mobile malware discoveries in that particular month. The average for the year was significantly more, and then in 2012 and then onwards, it started to grow. And for just the first half of last year, it was almost 30,000 new discoveries of mobile malware strains. Okay, and if you look at any of the other internet security vendors reports, they tell a similar tale around the problem. Okay, so let's evidence that claim. So Symantec's internet security threat report, the, the most recent one, um, so a new one presumably is going to come out very soon, but uh, 3,262 Android malware variants in 2013, so that, that one is looking back a little further than the others. The F-Secure threat report, 284 new, or 294 other new Android malware families um, compared to one new malware family for iOS, so you see the difference in the attention that the platforms are getting. And on iOS, it typically requires the device to be jailbroken before there's any likelihood of a problem on the device. More on that in a minute. And McAfee, similarly, okay, you can see significant growth um, in uh, quarter four of 2014 compared to quarter three of last year. So the problem is increasing and it's unlikely to go away is the message here. Okay, so again, drawing on what I wrote in the past, we're going to face a greater challenge as a result in terms of educating users that they need to think about this. Because up to that point, or up to now, they've not had to think about this, and they've been merrily using original cell phones and the early PDAs without malware being a threat that they would be likely to encounter. So looking at the differences in the mindset and the practices, again from our survey of 1,200 or so people, we found that the vast majority, although you know, disappointingly not all, had antivirus on their desktop or laptop device compared to only 10% saying they've got something on their smartphone. Now, of course, they weren't all Android users, so um, you know, arguably, for example, on iOS, they might say, well, there isn't something for us to use. So if we look at the ones that were Android respondents, so 688 from the, the total set of samples, we see only 14% of them saying that they've got antivirus. So a demonstrably different result from that observed in the room, for instance. I say it's not, or it wasn't just Android on which you could get antivirus. You could until very, very recently, get an antivirus package that ran on iOS, not notably to trap iOS viruses, but to scan content, for example, in your email or in your Dropbox that you might be passing on or receiving from other platforms. So if you received an attachment by email that had, for example, a Windows virus embedded within it, you could scan it on your device 
you could elect to scan it on your device. It wasn't an automatic process before passing it on to somebody else. So you could ha you know, have a bit of a community responsibility there. Now this uh, program is Intego Virus, uh, Intego Virus Barrier for iOS. Very recently, this and other such programs have actually been removed and prohibited from sale in the App Store. So Apple have basically said, no, we don't want these being sold anymore because it's confusing the customers. It's creating an impression that there is malware on iOS itself rather than you know, this being antivirus that scans for malware on other platforms. And it was, you know, the marketing for this, if you read it, was quite clear. It wasn't saying that it was iOS viruses, it was a tool for scanning other stuff, but the customer didn't understand enough about it, and so Apple getting concerned that it might be losing sales as a result, I guess. So the last issue I want to, to draw upon, I think, is the thing about whose device is it anyway. So this brings in the issue of whether you've issued it as an organization or whether it's a BYOD, bring your own device scenario. So from the user's perspective, okay, it makes sense that they have a device and they might like to use it for two different purposes, their personal use and their organizational use. But that might not sit necessarily as easily with us as organizations issuing devices to them. Okay, so they, as a consequence, if you, you don't control it any further, you can have a device that has data of both types. Okay, the clear thing that we need to recognize is, one way or another, people have mobile devices. So employees have their own, whether we've given them to them or not. And so we need to you know, basically recognize, it's not a question of whether we need to have a policy around it and whether we need to tackle it and provide guidance, it's how we do so. There isn't a right answer. It's not that we should ban the use of BYOD context or that everybody has to um, ban devices altogether, but we need to know where we stand with it and what the organization is prepared to accept. Should a, a dedicated work device be provided? Can it be afforded? Is the BYOD context a nice, easy way to get a mobile workforce without having to explicitly pay for it? Again, no right or wrong answer, but we need to recognize the implications. And if we do have a dedicated work device, we need to lock it down so that people don't make personal use of it and recognize that people might not like having to have two. In terms of BYOD, you have various options that you can have. So desirable to have a, a consistent level of protection or comparable level of protection for your data on somebody else's device as it would receive on your systems. But whether you've got that level of control over the device is far more debatable. So whether you can put mobile device management out there that encompasses personally owned devices of your employees, some might not accept that as particularly reasonable. So the devices that the employees control might not have any tracking enabled, might not be using the same level of authentication as the data would receive in the workplace or on company-owned devices. And data leakage, malware infection, all of those things could be or risk further exposure there. And the other thing about personally owned devices is the things that users themselves might elect to do with their device because it's theirs. And on iOS, that includes things like jailbreaking the device, so removing the, the layer of protection on the device that only enables you to uh, install Apple-approved apps. And on Android, it, it's called routing, and that's where you're able to get even lower level access to the device, control, regulate things like the CPU speed, etc. Which yeah, many users feel there is an advantage to doing, particularly the more technically oriented. But in both of these cases, it opens up further possibilities for malware to do something that it otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. So on iOS in particular, it now opens up jailbreaking opens up the opportunity to run unapproved code and basically to do things on the device that otherwise would have naturally been blocked. Okay, so these represent risks, I say, to us with our organizations if we've got these sort of devices operating within them. And I say in the BYOD context, that's where we need to watch out for it most particularly. One approach to, to helping to address the problem is mobile device management, so it's described there, and this basically gives a level of remote control and overall control over the, the, the portfolio of mobile devices that w are being used, particularly those issued by the organization. So drawing towards a close, what I'm not saying is that mobile devices themselves per se are a problem, but they do amplify the risk. They offer great opportunities, but there's an increased risk as a result.
In addition to needing the physical protection, we need to consider various technical controls and also attitude changes on the part of individuals. And it gets complicated by the fact that the ownership of the device can sit in different hands. For staff, there's you know, sort of nothing particularly new here that I'm going to say, but we need to recognize, get people to recognize that there is value not only in the device itself, but also what it's holding. To be aware of the safeguards that are available, particularly if it's their device and you're allowing them access to your systems through it, and to try and guide the use of those safeguards, and also, naturally, to appreciate the physical risks that they are exposing it to. For organizations, Except that these things are happening regardless of whether we've given the devices out ourselves or not. Have a policy, ensure that there's awareness then of both the policy and the reason that the policy is there in terms of the threats. Consider the potential for using mobile device management and certainly incorporate these devices into things like antivirus provision to try and ensure that you haven't got malicious content on them. And other than that, and still before the, uh, the red light appeared on the thing, uh, there's my contact details and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.